I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books is partnering with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the nation's largest cultural agency, to produce Visions of America. All stories, all people, all places. A digital first series of videos and conversations that explores our nation with a renewed interest in the places, people, and stories that have contributed to the America we live in today. This series provides an opportunity for all Americans to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and our nation's founding in advance of 2026. Today's conversation is the last in a series of three virtual Visions of America conversations and commemorates the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the armed forces. Led by IMLS Director Crosby Kemper, esteemed scholars Professor Matthew Delmont and Professor Jeffrey Sammons, as well as distinguished Brigadier General Terry Williams will explore the important role that people of color played in the armed forces from the Revolutionary War through the passage of President Truman's executive order and beyond. Connecting to our earlier conversations about our country's promises and obligations. This program will highlight the important role African Americans and people of color played in our country's history and wars, which has often been overlooked. Now it is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce the sixth director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Crosby Kemper. Crosby Kemper was commissioned by the White House on January 24th, 2020, following his confirmation by the United States Senate to lead IMLS, an independent government agency, which is the primary source of federal funding for the nation's museums and libraries. Welcome, Crosby. Thank you, Heather. Today, in celebration of the 75th anniversary of President Harry Truman's order to desegregate the armed forces on July 26, 1948, we've brought together three experts to talk about the extension of equality, of the meaning of the phrase, all men are created equal from the Declaration of Independence, and about those folks, African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, who are willing to give up their lives in order that their fellow citizens could enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Americans who, through slavery, discrimination, racism, had not experienced as much of that liberty and that pursuit of happiness, and yet still were willing to fight for it. In other words, we will recognize some of our fellow citizens who understood better than most the reciprocal nature of our rights and our obligations. It's not well known that the American armed forces were not always segregated. In the Revolutionary War, the over 5,000 Black Americans in the Continental Army fought primarily side by side with whites, sometimes with their white masters and slavers, and with the promise, frequently, that they would thereby earn their freedom. But there were also free men of color who volunteered to fight. And from the beginning, at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill, there were at least 103 Black Americans. We know that Peter Salem was at Le Lexington and Bunker Hill. He might well have fired the shot heard around the world. One man we might do well to remember is Colonel George Middleton, whose story is told in David Hackett Fisher's remarkable recent book, African Founders. Skilled with horses, a hostler, he fought at the Battle of Groton Heights and in actions on the New England coast. He commanded a group of former slaves called the Bucks of America. His service in that of the Bucks was commemorated by John Hancock himself with a banner bearing the Bucks insignia and Hancock's initials. His 1787 house still stands on Beacon Hill and is said to be the oldest surviving residence in that place, that historic place. His neighbor and acquaintance, the abolitionist Lydia Maria Child, tells the story of the annual celebration of the end of the slave trade held on Boston Common, which one year was attacked by a mob of young white hoodlums 
and the black celebrants were chased off the common. As the mob came to the top of Beacon Hill, they were met by Colonel Middleton with a loaded musket and an imprecation to the first white boy who should approach. They did not. They melted away. We might also note that George Washington, when he took command of the Continental Army, was against the employment of blacks initially. But then he saw the necessity for sheer needs of manpower in the Continental Army. So he said, let's have free blacks then. And after a while, he saw the fighting spirit of all blacks, so he gave up any distinctions. Indeed, under the tutelage, tutelage of his three anti-slaver, anti-slavery aides-de-camp, David Humphreys, John Lawrence, Alexander Hamilton, by the end of the war, he was corresponding sympathetically with abolitionists, and of course, at his death, he freed his slaves. The question then comes, why did it take so long to integrate the army? How did we lose our way, and how did we find it again? To answer that question, we have three distinguished guests. Professor Jeffrey Sammons of New York University, co-author with John Morrow of Harlem's Rattlers about the great, he calls them the undaunted, 369th Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Professor Matthew Delmont of Dartmouth, author of Half American, the epic story of African-Americans in World War II. And we have a practitioner, if you will, Brigadier General Terry Williams, U.S. Marine Corps, retired. There are so many examples of the fighting spirit of people of color in our history. Units in the Civil War, like the 54th Massachusetts, all black with white officers. By the War of 1812, the main representation in the Navy, their main representation was in the Navy, though under Andrew Jackson, at the Battle of New Orleans, there were free men of color, plus a number of slaves, so that close to half of Jackson's force were people of color. At the end of the Civil War, we lose any sense of African Americans in the military. West Point graduates only three African Americans between the Civil War and the First World War. Professor Sammons, why is that? What happens to allow this disintegration of African Americans in the military? Yes, well, uh, interestingly, uh, after the Civil War, uh, Congress passed uh, an act uh, that set up four segregated units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry. It was part of a bill to that was for the civil rights or to further the civil rights of, of black people. But a captain who is a graduate of uh, West Point, uh, Matthew Steele, a native Alabamian, uh, said that this was the worst example of codified segregation and discrimination uh, in the federal statutes and worse than uh, statutes in Mississippi uh, and uh, Alabama. So that was the, the solidification uh, of the uh, <clears throat> segregation of the black soldier. Uh, and it was supposedly uh, based in good intention. So se segregated uh, uh, forces, the, the Buffalo soldiers, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, um, they they fight in in the in the West and uh, and, uh, and and then in the Spanish American War and uh, and in Mexico, uh, chasing Pancho Villa, um, and, and and as part of that, the last graduate of West Point, the last black graduate of West Point, is Charles Young, um, who becomes Colonel Charles Young, the highest ranking African American officer, and 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 you and you write about the 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 need to establish uh, a, a black National Guard regiments across the country, and they happen in Illinois and Ohio and elsewhere. But in New York, it's a very big issue, um, and, and and this is right before World War One, and it becomes a political issue, and also in, in some sense a part of the uh, the the growth of Harlem and the and and what ultimately will become the Harlem Renaissance. Um, Charles Young had a pretty remarkable career. Well, we might 
uh, say something about the experience at West Point for uh, the African-American cadets. The first, of course, was Henry O. Flipper, uh, who was graduated in 1877 and was subsequently drummed out of the uh, service uh, on somewhat dubious charges uh, of not uh, a- actions not becoming a, uh, a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, and then he was followed by John Hanks Alexander, who gets lost in the discussion of the Black West Point, early West Point graduates. Uh, and uh, he seemed to be highly regarded and highly respected at West Point, but died very young. Uh, and the third was Charles Young, who came out in 1893, who actually spent five years at the academy, had some issues with math in the beginning of his career, and was called a load of coal and was ostracized by, as was Flipper, uh, by all the cadets, and as would be General uh, Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., uh, uh, who wasn't spoken to except uh, an official capacity for the four years that he and that's his latest the 1930s right yes. yeah yes so he came out in 36 right. um so it gives some sense of the climate at west point and of course these blacks flipper um uh hanks alexander and young were sort of a residue uh, flipper was directly tied to reconstruction and had been recommended uh, for the academy by a uh, Reconstruction uh, uh, a senator. Uh, the others were sort of part of the residue uh, of, uh, of, of Reconstruction, uh, but they had a very difficult time. It, and, uh, but Young and, ended up having a pretty great career. I mean, and he uh, not only fighting with the, uh, the Buffalo soldiers, but he became a superintendent of a national Park and uh, and a diplomat uh, in uh, uh, Liberia and elsewhere, uh, a, fa- a fairly substantial career. Substantial enough that uh, when 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 the the, the 369th is finally established, uh, uh, th- there is a movement. W. B. Du Bois is involved in it and others to to make him uh, the the com- the commander. That's absolutely correct. Um as early as 1915, uh, Young was seen by many in the black leadership uh, of New York to be the ideal person to lead this uh, black National Guard unit, which wasn't organized and established until 1916. The army had other ideas for him. And as you indicated, he served uh, on the border in the pursuit of Pancho Villa uh, in 1916, was the superintendent of Sequoia National Park, was at the Presidio uh, as well. And uh, uh, one of the things that was his undoing was when on the border, uh, he was in command of a young white lieutenant from Mississippi who resented taking orders from a black man. Uh, and uh, things were put in motion to actually deactivate uh, Young from uh, the uh, service, uh, and he was declared unfit for service. And there's an interesting story about Young. And of course, he was promoted to colonel, but at the same time deactivated, ends up uh, being in charge of some unit in the Ohio National Guard. Young decides to prove his fitness by riding a horse from Ohio to Washington D.C. That's pretty extraordinary. Yes, and only to be told when he arrives that he's proven the only proven the uh, fitness of the horse and not of himself. But the true story is that Young walked part of the way to give his horse rest al- along the the route. And, and uh, so, and, it and was this a decision is a, it, response. It, it yeah. goes all the way to President Wilson, and there are there there, there are seemingly people in the in the army who are in favor of you know, creating the black regiment, creating a, a place for African-Americans in, in the army. The Secretary of War Baker seems open to it and, and others, but it goes, the, Young's promotion 
goes all the way up and, and his retirement goes all the way up to President Wilson. Absolutely. He also was in line to become the first general, a black general, a brigadier general uh, who would have led a brigade in World War I. And that's the main reason why Young was deactivated uh, and uh, placed in reserve status. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, Wilson's denial it, it brings up the fact that um, it, probably the worst moment at the federal level, for sure, for African Americans is the Wilson presidency. That on, on progressive in many ways, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, was a Southerner, and uh, and and I, I think fair to say a racist. And of course, was involved in the segregation of the federal offices, um, the removal of a number of high-ranking Black officials uh, in the uh, federal government. Uh, but ironically, when Wilson wanted Blacks to guard, I'm sorry, troops to guard the White House, he chose the Washington, D.C. National Guard unit that was all African-American. And there was a concern that if he had uh, other units who had so-called hyphenates, that they might not have been as loyal uh, and faithful uh, as the black uh, soldiers from Interesting Washington. Interesting levels of discrimination. Yes. Yeah, and one thing about Truman's order that needs to be remembered is he simultaneously desegregated uh, the, the federal workforce in 1948 which was the first real reversal of Wilson's segregation of the federal workforce. Uh, and, and so, but, but then, but let's talk about the Harlem uh, uh, Rattlers, the Hellfighters, the 369th, because that's, a, that it, it does get created um, and they do, they do become uh, a fighting force in, uh, in France. And there are a lot of great names associated with the, with the Rattlers, the, uh, James Reese Europe, uh, Horace Pippin, Noble Sissel, uh, et cetera. It's kind of a, it, it, it's, it's a great so, uh, conjuries of some of the great, great uh, uh, parts of Harlem itself. Napoleon Bonaparte Marshall, who would go on to play a big role in uh, Haiti and Haiti's liberation uh, uh, from U.S. occupation. Uh, and, and, of course, Henry Johnson, who would uh, be the second black to receive the Medal of Honor uh, is one of the outstanding figures of the uh, 15th New York National Guard, which became the 360. Yeah, and we need to tell Henry Johnson's story because it's an extraordinary story, which which extends in many ways to our own time. That you know, his he is, he is now a Medal of Honor winner, and that's only happened very recently. Um, but his story was it was an incredible front page story uh, from France, from the 369th fighting with the uh, with the French on, on, in the lines with the with the French and the Argonne. Well, the story is that Henry Johnson, that Henry Johnson, uh, who was from Winston Salem, North Carolina, or born there, uh, spent uh, part of his adult life in Albany, New York, and that's where he was recruited for the. Uh, 15th New York National Guard. Uh, all uh, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts uh, were on guard duty in an advanced post uh, in basically the Argonne Forest and no man's land. Uh, a German raiding party attacked uh, their outpost uh, in hopes of capturing them uh, and gaining important intelligence from uh, these uh, two soldiers, a and also really, um, I think, affecting uh, the morale of, of the unit. Uh, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts uh, fought valiantly uh, to repel this force. Needham Roberts was knocked out of action early. Uh, Henry Johnson continued the fight, uh, and there was said to have been as maybe as many as 24 of these uh, German uh, raiders. Uh, and because of the uh, unbelievable, uh, you know, response of of of, of Johnson, uh, 
uh, uh, they fled. Many of the, those who survived. Roberts was wounded and out of, out of action, essentially. Exactly. And and, and John, Johnson Johnson had, I think, his gun jammed, and so a lot of what he did, he did with uh, his bolo knife. He did with the rifle butt, with the bolo knife, with his bayonet, etc. But what you mentioned, front page news. It so happened that Lincoln Iyer, Martin Green. Uh, and Irvin Cobb, three really famous American journalists, uh, happened to uh, visit uh, the camp the day after this event occurred. Uh, and uh, for because of them, it became front page uh, news across the nation. Uh, and it was very welcome news, not only for blacks, but for uh, the American people, because there had been no uh, infantry hero uh, of the American expeditionary forces until Henry Johnson. There had been aerial heroes, but none on the ground. In fact, Bellow Woods is after this event uh, of May 14th, May 15th, 1918. Uh, so even Pershing has to recognize uh, the valor of Johnson and Roberts. It's written up in Stars and Stripes. Uh, and this becomes, uh, Henry Johnson becomes a cause celeb, uh, and also for, especially for blacks, and shows that blacks can, uh, can fight. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, the army didn't want to use blacks as combat troops uh, in the war, uh, preferred to use them as laborers, but because of French uh, persistence uh, and a need for uh, combatants, uh, these men were turned over, the unit was turned over to- and The, uh, the, the, the French, French. Had, had greatly admired the 369th. They, they gave a unit, uh, the entire unit, uh, the Croix de Guerre. Uh, they the, did. That's because of the assault on Seychelles in September, October of 1918, near the end of the war. That's the major offensive. But let me back up to say that the French gave Henry Johnson uh, the Croix de Guerre with Palm, which is at the highest level. It's at the order of the army uh, for his exploits. Uh, Needham Roberts also received the Croix de Guerre, but not at the level uh, of the of the army, so this made Henry Johnson very special, and he's said to be the first uh, uh, American combatant, uh, infantry combatant, to receive the Croix de Guerre from the French. So he's and a huge hero, all. as as is the the three sixty ninth. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt in the book at the end of the war calls him one of the five bravest Americans, uh, and the three hundred sixty ninth has a, a a parade down Fifth Avenue uh, at the beginning of nineteen nineteen. Uh, which is a sort of phenomenal moment with James Reese Europe uh, and his band. The, the, the band itself became, uh, of the 369th, became famous, to, did they not? Well, uh, David, certainly, uh, and because of, of Pathé Records, uh, and also probably the reason why they're called the Hellfighters, uh, uh, or why it stuck, uh, because the band embraced that, uh, that uh, sensational name, but that march up Fifth Avenue, actually up Fifth Avenue from Madison Square Park uh, to Harlem, and that's the first time basically a parade has gone in that direction, uh, was a sight to behold. And they uh, marched in French formation, 16 across, which had never been seen uh, in the United States. Uh, and David Levering Lewis says that this marked, they were in the van uh, of the uh, Harlem Renaissance and the New Negro. Uh, and this marked the beginning of that uh, movement. And, and, and yet, it, you know, the, so there's this great moment, and, and it's also in some sense the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s, et cetera, with some of the people like Noble Sissel, Europe, uh, a part of it. Uh, and yet, 1919 is one of the worst years in the racial history uh, of the United the United States, riots uh, breaking out and and, and uh, death and destruction. Of course, and by 1921 we get the Tulsa massacre and and uh, and the 20s have the Harlem Renaissance on one side, 
And on the other side, you, you, you have probably the worst moments of Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan uh, in American history. Um, Can I say one other thing about yes. the, that, uh, Crosby? So uh, th there is a disparagement campaign after the war that's led by Robert E. Lee Bullard, who was a lieutenant general, uh, and I forget which corps he was in charge of, but was an avowed enemy of the black soldier and especially the black officer. Uh, and along with Colonel Alan Greer, who had been a chief of staff to uh, uh, General Ballou in the 92nd uh, Division. And basically they said that blacks were cowards, uh, that they were only a threat to themselves and to white women and children. Uh, but not to the enemy. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, the point that I want to make is that that kind of attitude uh, became codified in 1925 in the Army War College report on Negro manpower, uh, which basically said that Blacks were inferior mentally, uh, they were afraid of the dark, uh, they did not listen to or respect black officers, and it went on and on to disparage the black soldier and actually basically led to the uh, removal of the black soldier from uh, uh, the military. And as Matthew and the general will tell you, uh, that, that uh, the same things that happened before and during World War I will happen before and during World War II uh, in terms of the treatment and use of black. Right, we, we have to recreate the whole, uh, the whole situation again for, for World War II. For those of you just joining us, I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and you're watching PBS Books. I'm here with the STEAM scholars, Matthew Delmont, PhD, and Jeffrey Sammons, PhD, and the distinguished Brigadier General Terry Williams, discussing the important contributions that people of color have made in American history and wars. I'd now like to turn the conversation to Matthew Delmont and General Williams. As we head towards World War II, with this background that we've, we've been talking about, Roy Williams, who becomes head of the, uh, ultimately head of the, uh, and AACP says at the beginning of the war, white folks would rather lose the war than give up the, the luxury of their race prejudice. Um, is that a fair headline with, about what the black community uh, was thinking uh, uh, going into uh, World War II after Pearl Harbor? Uh, Matthew? It absolutely is. I think, as Professor Sam was just saying, part of what happens after World War I, despite the fact that you have more than 300,000 Black Americans who serve in World War I, after the war, there's an active campaign to disparage that service. And so Black Americans are really pushed out of the armed forces between World War I and World War II. So the first thing in the lead up to World War II that Black civil rights activists have to do is fight for the opportunity to serve. It might seem paradoxical, but initially the military doesn't want to have Black Americans uh, be given the opportunity to serve their country, even though it's readily apparent that the, the United States is about to enter into this world war. Um, so the first thing that the newspaper editors and civil rights activists have to do is fight for the opportunity to serve. Eventually, more than a million black men and women serve in the military during World War II, but they serve under segregated conditions. The entire military is racially segregated during World War II. At the start of the war, the Marine Corps doesn't allow any black Americans to serve in any capacity. And it's important to remember, segregation made no sense for a military that was trying to fight and win a global war on this scale. There was no strategic or tactical purpose for that segregation. I think that goes to Roy Wilkins' purpose, Roy Wilkins' uh, comment that white Americans would rather lose this war than give up the luxury of race prejudice, because it was really illogical. It was inefficient. It meant that they were the military was turning away black Americans who had PhDs from Harvard, who had advanced language skills, who had uh, science and technical backgrounds who could help win the war. They didn't pay attention to any of that. They only paid attention to the color of people's skins and assigned them to, in most cases, more menial or subservient roles. Right. And, 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 it, and it, with different attitudes and uh, of senior leaders in the military make, make a great difference. Uh, General Williams, you and I have talked about uh, General uh, Holcomb, who was, I, I believe, the commandant of the Marines at the beginning of the war, saying uh, he, he'd rather have 5,000 white soldiers than 25 white Marines or than 25,000 uh, uh, black Marines. An, an extraordinary right. statement. After the performance of uh, the Montreux Point Marines, in the Pacific that uh, 
Commandant Gates, General Gates, turned around and, and, and really sent a letter to one of his commanders saying, hey, this whole trial thing with the Negro Marines is over. They're just Marines. So uh, the performance, although recognized on the spot, I think both professors will tell you, um, and recognized by some, it still was, was nowhere near where, where it needed to be. And, and yet, there, you know, with all this discrimination, there's a, the Pittsburgh Courier's uh, editor, Robert Band, says at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the war, uh, despite all the, 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 this, he says it in, in anger, I think, but let us die for America if need be, for we are Americans. There's still this incredible patriotism and, and a sense of needing to prove something uh, you both, Professor Delmont and Professor Sammons, you both use the the the, the phrase "full citizenship" uh, in in your your work. That there seems to be in both World War One and World War Two uh, a, a, a felt need in the African American community to show something, uh, to attain that, to to prove uh, prove everyone wrong, prove uh, the Marines wrong. Absolutely. I mean, for Black Americans during World War II, the stakes are extraordinarily clear. The rallying cry for Black Americans in the war was the double victory campaign, because they understood themselves to be fighting both for victory over fascism abroad, but also for victory over racism at home. And it's important that we understand those were, were dual war aims. Black Americans really did see themselves fighting two wars at the same time. They were absolutely committed to the military victory. They wanted to do everything they could to help defeat the access to the Nazis, because they understood the the terror that the Nazi ideology was going to bring to bear, not just on Europe, but to the world, because they understood how closely paralleled it was to the kind of Jim Crow segregation and violence they were experiencing here in the United States. But they also understood that those military battles weren't enough. It, it didn't do any good to defeat white supremacy abroad and then come home to that same kind of white supremacy and racial discrimination at home. So the second half of that double victory campaign was fighting the civil rights battles. Coming home in 1945, those black veterans became the, the backbone, the, the foundation of the civil rights movement that comes into even more full fruition in the 1950s and 60s. So there's a sense in which the, in the First World War, uh, African-Americans say we're, we're fighting for democracy to save the, through the world, but also at home. And the double V is, is, the, is essentially the, uh, the, the same thing. And in a way, it relates to what W.B. Du Bois says in Souls of Black Folk about the double consciousness uh, of, of Black Americans. They're, they're, they're at once in some sense, black, and uh, they are American. It's not the same consciousness. It need, and, uh, and 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 then during during the during the war, uh, there this notion of uh, of heroism uh, as a as a proof uh, happens over and over again uh, as as the the various units, the the Tuskegee Airmen, for instance. Uh, and Benjamin Davis has been mentioned again as the for, you, 47 years between Charles Young graduating from West Point and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Uh, graduating uh, from uh, from West Point. The Tuskegee Airmen, they're probably the best known unit in the uh, in the war. And and, and they, they started out with five, five graduates. The achievements during the war are, are pretty phenomenal. Uh, at the same time, there, there are race riots in Detroit. There, there are people uh, 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 picketing uh, uh, white people, uh, demonstrating against black people, getting jobs in the, in the war plants, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, the, 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 the whole notion of Jim Crow happening during, during the war while African Americans are fighting uh, on, uh, at the front uh, is pretty extraordinary. It is, and if you put yourself back in that time frame, imagine yourself as a, an average Black American picking up the Pittsburgh Courier, or Chicago Defender. You're reading stories about the Montfort Point Marines that the general just mentioned. They had an extraordinary performance, particularly in the Pacific Theater in Saipan and Battles of Iwo Jima. They demonstrate that they're fully Marines. It's a, a remarkable thing to to happen in just a, a few short years, from having no Black Americans serve in the Marine Corps to having the Montfort Point Marines be considered fully Marines. You're reading those stories at the same time you're reading about how there are whites who refuse to use the same bathroom facility 
these at these defense plants that this again they would rather have these defense plants shut down for weeks at a time they would rather go on strike than have them be integrated and so that's part of what black americans are grappling with at this time frame they're again they're, they're fighting to win the war but they're fighting to, to change america they want to have a america in which they can be treated as as full citizens and they're they're their stories, uh, uh, you know, we've told the story of Henry Henry Johnson. Their, their stories, for instance, Vernon Baker, which you you talk about Vernon Baker in uh, in, in your book, um, who eventually, like uh, Henry Johnson, receives the Medal of Honor, though very late. Um, can, can you tell his story? It's pretty extraordinary. Sure. Yeah, Vernon Baker. So during the war, there are 433 medals of honor awarded. None of them are awarded to black troops. Um, in the 1990s, the military conducts a review and ends up promoting seven people who re re received the Distinguished Service Cross to the Medal of Honor. Vernon Baker was the only person still alive to receive his medal in person. He was 77 years old at the time. And initially, when he got the call from the White House, he didn't want to go. He said, I performed these acts five decades ago. You should have honored me then rather than now. During the war, he was part of an infantry unit uh, and helped to take out several machine gun positions uh, and helped the Allies take over a uh, German mountain stronghold in Italy. And one of my favorite quotes in the book comes from Baker. He said that I was an angry young man. We were all angry, but we had a job to do and we did it, which I think encapsulates a lot of the sentiment of that generation of black veterans. They, they recognized the hypocrisy. They recognized the discrimination, yet they gave everything they absolutely could to help win the war. Doris Miller was a 22-year-old mess attendant, originally from Waco, Texas, who was on the USS West Virginia. Uh, it's important to understand, in the Navy at that time period, black men could only serve as mess attendants, where their jobs on the ship was to do laundry and cook and clean, essentially serve white officers. Even though that was Miller's responsibility on the ship, once the bombing of Pearl Harbor happened, he performed heroically. He went above deck and helped attend to the wounds of his wounded shipmates. Uh, he helped to make a, a makeshift stretcher and move his captain to a safer spot in the deck. And then when his lieutenant ordered him to go to the anti-aircraft -air guns, he went over there. And even though he had no training on the ship's weapons, he started firing the aircraft gun at some of the Japanese planes that were circling overhead, potentially hitting and downing one of them. Even though it took several weeks for Miller's name to get announced, there was a rumor that circulated that a black mess attendant had performed heroically. And it really, it galvanizes black Americans because they're, they're saying, look, if you just give us the opportunity, we, we have the courage, we have the bravery uh, to be able to perform in this way. And I think to connect it to the present, in a couple of years, the Navy is going to launch a, an aircraft carrier that's going to be named after Doris Miller. If we think about all the things that might surprise someone from 1941, the fact that an aircraft carrier is going to be named after a black mess attendant would have to be right up there on the top of the list. That, that, Yet uh, the Navy was very slow to give him an honor. Uh, and in fact, it took pressure from uh, the NAACP and other black organizations to make that happen. Um, and there's also a movement afoot to uh, have Dory Miller receive the Medal of Honor. And, and uh, Professor Simmons, you're on the, the Medal of Honor Commission. Is that, is that correct? I'm on a uh, Valor Medals uh, task force review team uh, and uh, that started out of the World War I Centennial uh, Commission, but it's only looking at the uh, soldiers of world, black soldiers and, and other minorities actually from World War I. There's never been a systematic review uh, for World War I and there are only two uh, blacks who received the Medal of Honor, Freddie Stowers and Henry Johnson from uh, World War One, And as you indicate, uh, Henry Johnson's came in 2015, Stowers in 1991. Yeah, I, I was a, 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 a small part, a very small part of the, the, uh, the those folks lobbying for uh, Henry Johnson's uh, uh, medals. I knew a man named Hen Herman Johnson in Kansas City who thought he was Henry Johnson's son, which turned out not to be to be true. But it, he he was very engaged in uh, in, in uh, actively trying to uh, to to see uh, Henry Johnson get his medals. So, General, I, l let me ask you this question: uh, the, uh, Today, things have changed, um, uh, and and it must do. Uh, as an African American officer, for other African American officers, it must do some some good to see the sort of reparative work that the Medal of Honor, uh, going to uh, uh, and the reconsideration of medals and for for various people, um, have have things changed a lot? Have things changed enough? Uh, 
Uh, absolutely, Kemper. Uh, t today, uh, we've got policies in place that not only look to award fairly those service members who have performed heroic, heroically or uh, that have uh, been worthy of an award. Uh, so not only do we have those policies in place, but we've also got processes and controls. Uh, and although they're still lengthy, they're much more thorough. They've got documented witnesses. We've got superior officers who get checked. We've got a number of uh, levels of scrutiny. And I think what's even, even more important is even after the fact, many years later, uh, we've got panels that look back to ensure no one was missed. So it's today's military, very, very uh, uh, deliberate uh, look to ensure fairness and equity in, uh, in awarding rightfully uh, those who, uh, who are heroic, whether in combat or, or, or any, other, uh, any other deeds. And uh, at the end of World War II, you know, there are these, you know, great moments, the Tuskegee Airmen and their, their remarkable uh, uh, service and, and the number of uh, uh, shootings, uh, shooting, shooting down uh, enemy airplanes and, uh, and, and being a, a part uh, of, the, of the war in Europe, a significant part of the war in, war in Europe, uh, the, the, the 24th. Uh, regiment and the 92nd division, et cetera, the, the, all, all the things that, that were done. And yet, as veterans come home uh, in, in 1945 and 1946, this is, it seems to be a replay in some, in some ways of what happened in 1919, 1920, 1921. Uh, there are still lynchings. There are, uh, the, the, and, and, and famously, there's a story of Isaac Woodard, who was blinded. Can you tell, tell that story? Because it had a big impact on Harry Truman. Yeah, just as you're saying, the kind of violence that black veterans encounter at the end of World War II was, was an outrage. Uh, there were at least a dozen examples of black veterans being attacked, uh, murdered, or beaten uh, in the years just after the war, some while still wearing their military uniforms. And the one that resonated most powerfully across the nation was Isaac Woodard. Uh, he had just finished a tour in the Pacific Theater, uh, was coming home uh, to returned to his family in South Carolina. Uh, there was a, a dispute with the bus driver. He ends up getting um, taken off the bus by a sheriff uh, and beaten so badly he was blinded for life. The sheriff used his nightstick to beat him and essentially gouged his eyes out. Woodard's case uh, gets national attention in part because Orson Welles, the, the radio commentator and, and activist, takes it up in, in consultation and, and at the urging of the NAACP. And so among the, the dozens of, of cases of, of violence, that one gets, gets the most national attention. Among the people who pays attention to it is President Truman. Uh, Truman, of course, was a World War I veteran himself. And so he, he really was outraged by this the violence and the treatment that Black veterans um, encountered. And it's one of the factors that, that led him to sign the executive order in 1948. Uh, it was the intense political pressure he was receiving from, from Black activists, the, the sense of the importance of Black voters in the future, the Cold War pressures were there, but the, the moral outrage at the, the beating of, of Woodard and the, the killing of other Black veterans really did impact Truman. And, and uh, there are a lot of forces at work. He had uh, set up the first Civil Rights Commission, which had reported with a dozen or so recommendations none of which he could really get past the, the, the Southerners in the, in the Senate, the white Southerners in the, uh, in the Senate. But he did have, he had two vehicles that he could do on his own. One being the, the desegregation of the federal workforce itself. And then of course, the desegregation of the armed forces. There's, you know, there's the question of, you know, how much of this was political? The black vote was important in, uh, in er in, in big cities, in in states that he had to have to uh, to be renominated, to be nominated for president, and 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 to to be ele elected uh, in 1948, but but he also by by issuing the order, he guaranteed that he had another opponent uh, uh, from the South, uh, Senator Thurmond, of course, as a Dixiecrat candidate for president. So, what what's your your view of uh, of of his decision? Was it a political decision, a moral decision, or, or both? 
I think it was both. And for a president, I think all decisions at their at their root are political. Uh, and it really did reshape the political landscape in the country. It meant that Black Americans moved more fully into the Democratic column, but it also meant that the segregationist wing of the Democratic Party split off uh, initially with the Dixiecrats and eventually leaving the Democratic Party altogether. Uh, it did show um, executive leadership, though, from Truman, for him to, to take this, this calculated political risk to sign the executive order to um, start the integration of the armed services was, was extraordinarily important. Of course, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a full six years before the military is, is fully integrated. And then it's still an ongoing process to pass the kind of policies that the general was referring to, to make sure that the actual experience of a people of color in the military is equitable. But we wouldn't have the kind of uh, military we have today with the, the demographic diversity and the opportunities for, for different racial ethnic groups if it were not for that initial building block of the executive order in, in 48. We shouldn't forget to mention the GI Bill uh, and how that, in many respects, was a raw deal uh, for Blacks, uh, veterans, especially around education and housing. And uh, uh, whereas Blacks were sort of shunted into uh, a technical and uh, a non-academic uh, institutions, uh, and weren't given uh, uh, loans for housing, uh, which was still largely segregated. And uh, part, of, part of the legacy of, of uh, and, and you've mentioned this, uh, 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 Professor Delmont, but part of the, the veterans themselves, and, 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 I, and I'm sure, General, that, that there's an effect on, on the armed forces uh, in, in, in this. People like Oliver Brown, the father in Brown v. Board, Medgar Evers, Rosa Parks herself uh, was was in a, a war in, was a, a employed in a war industry in, uh, in 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 Alabama. There's there's a there, there's an empowering effect of what happened during the war that is longer lasting than after the First World War. Uh, would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I think by and large, that entire generation of, of Black veterans comes back and, and they fight to change the country uh, in, in all aspects, including the military. I think that's important for the people who made their careers in the military in uh, the Korean War and eventually in Vietnam and, and the later conflicts. They were doing the underground work to make sure that that institution, that organization was going to be an equitable place that didn't, didn't come overnight, didn't come strictly through a presidential executive order. It took through, it came through hard, dedicated work of, of activists and, and citizens who, who wanted uh, this country to be the kind of um, equitable democracy that it, it can and should be. And and I think it's fair to say, yeah, I think it's fair to say today, much more equitable across the board. You've got the Veterans Administration that uh, provides the new GI Bill that is, uh, I used it myself, uh, for myself and for my son. Uh, it can be used by all service members based on the rules that uh, currently exist and depending on when they came in. Uh, but the Veterans Administration also provides medical support to those veterans who have gotten out, regardless of color. Uh, so I think we've come a long way. There are checks and balances, medical evaluations before and after you've, uh, you're leaving the, uh, uh, the armed services, uh, treatment and re rehabilitation, You've got case managers. It really is a much, much more equitable uh, uh, outcome since uh, since the wars, uh, World War II, and, and, and on. And, and Professor Sammons, you, being involved in, uh, in in the the history of the Medal of Honor and and and, and that, are, are we, have we finally with the seven Medal of Honor awardees, only Vernon Baker still alive with the. Uh, recognition of Henry Johnson, the recognition perhaps of Doris Miller. Are, are we finally getting to a point where, where we're recognizing our, our history as we should? Uh, we're making steps toward it, but there's a long way to go. And there's a recent example, Paris, I can't remember his full name, uh, uh, who I think served in Vietnam and had been recommended for the Medal of Honor by his superiors and his paperwork kept getting lost. And finally, I think in a, maybe at age 86, he recently received uh, a Medal of Honor, uh, which, you know, is just, uh, I, th I think, evidence that this stuff still continues. To it's, still yeah. Yeah. it's still a struggle. It's still a struggle. 
And uh, we should also mention uh, uh, the, the Nisei Regiment in World War uh, to the Japanese American young men who were recruited from internment camps uh, to become one of the, not the most decorated regiment uh, in American history. And the wind talkers, the cloud talkers, the Native Americans who in World War I joined up at, at a higher percentage than, than any other group. And they were not even technically, many of them not even technically American citizens at that point, which, you know, the the, the, the question of citizenship and, and, and obligations in, in our, our history is, is a two-way street. And, and, and there are those who are willing to, to serve and, and to offer up their, their lives who got no recognition. And we still, it seems to me, offer, owe them uh, a debt of recognition at the very least, and probably much more than, uh, than that. Um, so, uh, it, I'd like to 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 mention the the story of uh, uh, a Tuskegee Airman whom I knew, uh, which is uh, uh, Colonel Charles McGee. Colonel McGee uh, flew in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, uh, and had four when he retired had 409 combat missions that he had flown, which might be the most at his retirement anyway that any American had flown. And, uh, and he, I'm from Kansas City, and he ran the, uh, in his last uh, post for the uh, uh, for, for the Air Force, he he ran the Richard Skabauer Air Force, and then eventually, when he retired, the downtown Kansas City airport, and uh, and he spoke in the Kansas City Library, um, and and he spoke without any other sense than a sense of duty that what he had done was his duty. Uh, as a, a member of the American Armed Forces, uh, and, uh, and and I and I, re I remember him, and he he, he got some some uh, instance of, of fame. He flipped the coin at the 2019 Super Bowl uh, with the NFL recognizing his length of service, but not telling his his story, his incredible story. He did he did actually retire as a a general. Um, uh, so I, it, it seems to me we're beginning to recognize, but we're still at the beginning of the recognition of what people of color in this country have done for this country. Um, history tells us perhaps it's not too late to honor them as the best representatives of the moral equality of all pronounced in the declaration, and maybe as moral, morally superior examples of devoting their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to their vision of America. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Very thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It's time to close our conversation. Now I'd like to invite Heather back in from PBS Books. Crosby, thank you so much. This has been an extraordinary conversation. Thank you for guiding the conversation, Crosby. It's been really wonderful to get to hear so very much from our guests, Professor Delmont and Professor Sammons. We are so appreciative for you sharing your knowledge and expertise. Brigadier General Williams, thank you for sharing your insights and your firsthand perspectives. We certainly hope all of our viewers have gained a greater understanding of the importance of the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the armed forces and added to uncovering hidden American stories. Just as a reminder, beginning in fall 2023, IMLS Director Crosby Kemper will host monthly shows about lesser known historical sites that symbolize an aspect of the spirit of America's independence. We'll launch this on September 27th by going to Miami to see the Freedom Tower. Well, we always like to thank our library and mu museum partners and numerous PBS stations across the country for sharing this important content with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Well, until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading. <laughs>